Alright, hey guys, welcome back to another live stream uh, where I'll be working on Dino Defenders. Um, we're going to be starting this stream by just finishing off the picture we were working on last week where I was doing Jude. I didn't get around to finishing it midweek, um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll begin with this. I'm just going to put some music on and then... Uh, uh, Let's have a look. Uh, let's have a little look. See, hello, never not so clever at this. It's going to put on the usual shebang of music, and then uh, and then I'll play something uh, in a minute that I think is quite interesting um, to do with Michael Crichton. Uh, let me see. So what we want to do is get the colour. But yeah, so all in all, so far so good with this series. Um, uh, with episode 4. I managed to get a bit more work done to it this week actually. I didn't do this frame because where I'm working off stream is a different location in the episode to this and I actually had a bit of time to work on it and, uh, and I think I mentioned this in a previous stream but I'm like <laughs> I'm work currently working on a frame that is uh, is taking me a very long time to complete because there's a lot of animation in it and, uh, and I'm juggling that with family and, and work and all that sort of stuff but you know, like I said, uh, was it last stream? It's like a big marble statue. Just slowly pick away at it. Slowly pick away at it. And we'll eventually get to uh, something resembling a finished product. But it does amaze me sometimes to think back to, you know, when this all started and how far I've actually come. Like the, the scenes I'm working on for episode four, four, which have been in my mind for so, so long. And it's like, I can't believe I've actually got to that point where I actually am animating them. Uh, never not so clever at this asks, are you at least having fun editing Dragon Curve? Oh yeah, I'm having loads of fun editing Dragon Curve. That's the thing, I'm currently negotiating with Clayton on uh, how that relationship is going to work going forward. Uh, because it's yeah, it could, it could change a lot of things for me, but it's whether Clayton uh, wants to do it or not. So we'll get there. But like, I'm having fun. And I'm I'm just I'm really happy to like at least provide Clayton uh, some free time so he can actually do stuff that's other than um, I don't know. Relieve some of the stress for that guy because like you know he's all systems go and. I just thought if I if I can edit some videos for him, then uh, he he'd have the time f freed up to you know make videos where he has fun with them and uh, enjoys making videos. I mean, he does enjoy making videos, obviously, because that's why he does it. But um, you know what I mean. A bit more like let your hair down, silly videos. So, and that's the sort of approach that he wants for Dragon Curve. It's a place where he can find a new audience for other content other than Jurassic um, and mean and it also means like he will have more time to work on other Jurassic stuff and I was saying to him in the future that like obviously we're working together if he uh, wants any uh, anyone to chew more ideas over for Jurassic Park videos then I'm there I'll be there with him working on them like working not directly on that channel but like working uh, on with him behind the scenes to help him craft some more videos. Hello Chaos, hello Mikey. Yeah. So, we're gonna get Jude done quickly here. And we're basically just in this scene entirely for this stream I think I'm gonna be working on. Uh, you know, Rose in the uh, 
in the hospital bed. Have you had a crash course on Red Resident Evil lore? Says so never not so clever. This no, I like <laughs> this is the thing. I have no idea. I, I know nothing about Resident Evil, but I'm learning through Clayton playing. That uh, uh, you know, I'm learning my Resident Evil lore through him. I say that I'm not really memorized much, but um, but it is fun. And I will say this: I never played Torok when I was a kid. But watching Clayton play Torok really makes me want to play Torok. And that game looks like a lot of fun. But the funny thing is, is because Clayton knows that game so, so well, it's like, um, I now know where all the secrets are and how to do stuff. Mikey asks, Rose looks pretty beat up. Does she have any other family besides Mia? Um, yes, they do have other family members, but um, but the, the, nothing nothing that's going to be important to the story. Like distant, distant family members. Like if you think Mia, straight after the funeral of her parents, came here, so... Harrison says, Hi Terradome, I love your videos and love Dino Defenders. I was wondering what your favourite hybrid is in Jurassic Park Chaos Effect. Um, probably the uh, Compsteg Nafus. We're going to go hybrid because my favourite one from the Chaos line was the uh, Alpha Raptor. But that's not really a hybrid, so I'm not going to choose that one. But I'll go Steg uh, Compsteg Nafus. Hello, Lance. He says, made it. Clayton legit plays that game like a speedrunner. Well, it's funny because it, I might need to clip that part out from episode one. Uh, there's there's a bit, I don't know if it's still in episode one, where he says, I'm not going to speedrun Torok. <laughs> and, then, and then like just cut to like him speedrunning through it. There might be something funny I can do with that. That's something I have planned for today's stream, and you know, you, you know, guys, like these streams that I do, they are. Some people have called them relaxing and all that sort of stuff, but they're usually like just a, a laugh. But today we're going to get a little bit more serious. Today I have a video that I want to play in the background uh, from Michael Crichton, uh, all about the quality of uh, the American news media, because I figured it's like quite apt. And quite, um, not quite apt, what's the word I'm looking for? Quite appropriate for what's going on in today's world. To show kind of how prophetic Crichton could be in his uh, his predictions. Now there's some things he's got wrong. Um, but yeah, so I've I, I, I downloaded this C-SPAN. I bought it by the way, I bought, the, bought a copy of it from C-SPAN. Um, so hopefully they won't you know, come after the stream. But, uh, yeah, I just figured it'd be quite interesting to listen back to that and and uh, and sort of get more ears on that. So. Uh, 
Hello, Dr. Aaron Cooler. Dr. Aaron Cooler. Um, now we need to open up. There's a specific type of pink on his head. Harrison said, I love Crichton's books. I read The Indominus Strain and obviously read Dress Pack and the Lost World. Nice. Yeah, I've ne read nearly every single one of his books. The only ones I haven't read are The Great Train Robbery, um, The Thirteenth Warrior, Timeline. I own Timeline, but I haven't actually read it. Um, uh, In Case of Need, which is another one I own, but I don't, uh, I haven't read. But uh, yeah, I've read pretty much all the others. I haven't read any of his ones where he was writing under a, a different name. Where is this file I need? Where be this file? There it be. So I want to get the pink, the pink stink on his head and just kind of add it slightly because it's like dying down now like the slap from the tail is uh, <laughs> is, is, is dying off although let me have a look at the frame that I had where he is sat there how pink was it Eaters of the Dead yeah that's another one I haven't read oh that's the 13th Warrior isn't it the 13th Warrior is the film that was named after Eaters of the Dead. That's right. That's right. Okay. Thirty percent pink. Um, yes, I have read the Evolution of Claire Harrison. Yes, I have. I own a copy of it. Okay, uh, let's get let's get the color right. So It's funny because the video we're going to listen to today uh, Crichton wrote a book basically about that called um, Airframe which is one of my favourites of his I do want to reread that at some point but yeah it's about this plane that sort of is going along with all these passengers on it and then it suddenly drops and I can't remember if a, a passenger dies I believe they do and then it follows the 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 journalistic circus around that incident and the uh, and the airline which is trying to like save face and trying to correct its public image in the face of fake news have you read uh, Gerdesic Plark at least no I haven't Dr. Aaron Cooler he said I haven't read Dragon Teeth yet it's on the shelf in front of me Dragon Teeth was okay but I, w I was a bit depressed by Dragon Teeth because you could tell obviously it was unfinished because they published it after he died and it, it hadn't been finished really and it, it, I don't know it just it felt a bit wrong it was like I should, don't know if I should be reading this like it felt like Crichton probably wouldn't want this out there uh, half finished but then I don't know maybe he would I mean he's dead so it's like maybe maybe he wouldn't care but um I don't know, it just it felt a bit weird reading a half finished book from a dead man. Yeah, Sphere is my favourite. Um Aaron. 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 
Harrison says, have you heard of the fan novel The Dark Continent Jurassic World? Yes, I have. That's uh, Bryson Ayer's book, isn't it? That he's been working on since he was like four years old or something. <laughs> I haven't read it, actually. Hello there, Big Shark. Hello there. Right, so let's get this movable feast underway. Never not so clever that says his daughter's holding company is going to start working on working the unused manuscripts. Hmm. If they got that Richard Preston guy, the guy who helped or cry, or helped finish Micro, uh, then you know that'd be good because that was a good book. Hello, Tombstone. He says Howdy from Australia. Hello there. Right, um, actually I do need to open up that file again. Where is it? Because I just want to match the lighting. Okay, so he has bright, bright light. The light, the light of spite. So we want it like this. And I'm actually gonna change the color like that. Might even up the brightness. <laughs> Tombstone says bright light, bright light, bright light. Okay, that looks pretty darn good. Speaking of Pratchett, has anyone watched The Watch on BBC? No, I haven't. I don't have a license. I don't have a, a TV license, so I can't watch BBC. <laughs> Woe is me. I don't care. I don't care that I don't get to watch BBC. Uh, what are we doing? What are we doing? Okay. So we want highlights. There we go, that's what we want. Tomb says, I forget in the UK you need a TV license. Well, the thing is, like, you need a TV license to watch live TV, like TV that's being broadcast live. You don't need one if you want to watch things like Netflix or anything on the internet. Um, you don't need to watch, like, some of the streaming services. So, like, the BBC made this thing called BBC iPlayer. And, uh, and the idea was that if you didn't have a TV license, you could catch up on all your BBC... Um, programs 24 hours later uh, when they're not being broadcast live but then they changed the rules so now you need a TV license to watch that so it kind of makes the whole iPlayer business completely pointless because <laughs> the BBC wants their funding um, I just can't be bothered with it the BBC doesn't make enough programs for me to warrant spending 200 quid a year or whatever it's ridiculous Matchy, hello don't worry you're not late I've only been streaming for uh, how long have I been streaming for 20 minutes hello Big Shark thank you for the two dollar tip thank you very much right so Jude is in the background here I might just darken him a little bit And then we're going to take Jude in the chair. 
complaint. Can we take Rose out? Ooh. Ooh! Might just, um... I think I have this file in a different format. Let me just have a look. Yeah, look, I have the same exact frame, but just without all the details. So what I might do... This is Rose Hospital Room 2, so I might delete Rose, delete Jude, file save as Hospital Room 2, replace it, yeah, it's just so we can get that, um, that pipe in, uh, that bag in the way. Right, now let's put them back in, let's take Jude, we're going to blur him. Just a little bit, and then we're going to blur the background as well. But just a little bit. So it just gives that depth. That depth to the picture. Um, might just add a little bit of a shadow under Jude as well, make him pop from that background. Harrison said, when I watched your my Jurassic Park collection video and you talked about your Jurassic Park 4 script, I thought it was an actual script. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Aaron Cooler said, they said the other day the license fee might be done away with in a few years. Yeah, I will believe it when, when I see it. I mean, there's so much stuff on the internet to watch and streaming services. It's like, do you even need the BBC? Like, I don't miss it. I don't miss it. Okay, so I think if I... It's um, going to... Okay, so I'm going to merge all these and then save it as a PNG because obviously you got the screen up there. So <laughs> Disney is going to buy the BBC. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, Harrison asks, "Did you like Camp Cretaceous? And are you excited for season two? Uh. Camp Cretaceous, I thought, was a real missed opportunity, uh, and it felt cheap. It had some interesting ideas, but no, I didn't. I didn't particularly overly enjoy it. And I know, like, I'm not the target audience; it's for kids. But I kind of felt like that the way the show was made, it was made with the idea behind it that. I don't know, it, it treated its audience with no respect. So, and I know I've banged on about this, like, people who watch these streams regularly will know what I'm about to say. But, like, when the kids go to the Mosasaur arena, the, um, the Main Street has just disappeared. And the Main Street's just not there. And so, it's really irritating because the whole plot hinges on these kids can't find their way off the island whereas if they'd made it to the Mosasaur paddock they would have at that time in the time frame that they reached there they would have been there when they were cleaning up the pteranodon so they would have just been rescued straight away so in order to make keep the drama going they just basically didn't animate main street when they could have so it, tre it treats his audience with no respect and the canon of Jurassic Park with no respect so Season 2 looks a little bit more fun than Season 1, I'll grant them that, but like I haven't watched that clip that was going around of the T-Rex making its nest or whatever. Uh, I probably... W I'll watch the series, obviously, to see what it's like, but I'm not... I haven't got high hopes for it. Mm. 
maybe I just need to outline his eyes just a little bit. Just to get the light glow on his eyes. Okay, so I think we're done there. Let's save that as uh, Rose Hospital Room Side 1. Save it as a PNG, as I said. Um, I won't throw this into the edit because I want to get on to painting more. So. Uh, So I want to open up this because let's get let's get Ruz. Here she is. So we want this frame just so I can get her looking right. Never lots clever that says, no, oh, Jude seems actually worried. Well wouldn't you be after uh <laughs> after seeing the tower fall and uh seeing people you know die? No, he is a little bit worried. So let's now, you know what I need to do? I need to make the canvas big. Let's change it to thirty and thirty. Boom, and you can actually see all the outside area. The reason I'm doing this is because I can't, I don't have enough room on the page because due, uh, Rose. Why can't I do this? Oh, that's why it's freaking me out because the bars, it needs to be above the bars. There we go. Uh, and then I also want to open up. No, actually, tell a lie. I'm being an idiot. I'm being an absolute fool. Ignore me. Fool of a duke. Just bung that there. Um, Matchy says, Jack, do you have any spoilers for season four for Dino Defenders Extreme? Uh, and Never Not So Clever, this basically said. Season episode four is a long way off. Yes, it is. We said season four, but I'm assuming you mean episode four. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not really revealing anything from episode four. Not after you'd have to go back through the streams because I do reveal some stuff there, but I'm not revealing any more. Uh, what do I need? Rows, and I need rows from the front. Oh look, there's one right there. Well, that one she's sort of leaning her head down. I want this one. that lines probably get it in December as a Christmas present oh, I don't e I don't even want to speculate on when this is going to be released <laughs> December would be nice Right, so let's bring over this and get Rose looking how she should be.
<laughs> Big Shark says we're patient people. I know you are. You guys are the best. You guys have been so patient already. Like, I won't beat around the bush, and this is n in no way a complaint, but like... The, re the reason it's slowed down is obviously I've decided to have a family. And, you know, we've got a baby now, so everything sort of grinds to a halt when you have a baby and they become top priority. So, and I knew that was going to happen. Um, so, for sake of argument, had the baby, had we not had a baby, then obviously work would have been going really fast. But a family is way more important. Thing is, this also episode four is so ambitious as well, so it's like that's why it's going to take longer as well. There's like a lot of stuff I want to do with episode four that. Uh, I didn't think was possible actually when I was doing the other episodes but episode 3 kind of proved something to me that I could do certain things with this Never not so clever. This says, "Bro, family comes first, <laughs> but it's still awesome that you found even a sliver of time to work on something of your own." Well, that's the thing. It's like um, I put. The, I have a lot of thanks to my wife for that because my wife is very understanding with uh, the way I operate, and she understood. She, she, like, it's going to sound really corny. She believes in uh, my passion for storytelling. Because she's a storyteller herself, you know. She's a creative type like me. And um, so she was, like, helping me organize when she was, like, when uh, I should be able to stream and stuff, so... Matchy says, I, re I really think this is this cartoon series deserves more attention. Well, you just got to spread the word. Word of mouth is the key here. Like The YouTube al algorithm isn't going to help Dino Defenders. Uh, uh, well, it will help the episodes a little bit, but it won't help the live streams or anything. Um, but word of mouth is the best. Sharing it and telling people about it and all that sort of stuff, that's, that's what will get it. The views over time. And I honestly think that once I've got the full movie done and I've edited all five episodes together into one long movie, I think that's going to be the thing that will get more eyes on it as well.
the weight is worth it, says Mikey. Uh, family is important. Also, I didn't know what went into animation. The level of detail for something that might only appear for a few seconds, it's amazing. Yeah, and that's the one thing also. Like, I could have made this series much quicker if I didn't want to add so much detail into it. But the reason I wanted to add detail is to make it so it's something that could last a long time and make people, I don't know, give it this kind of... I didn't want to make it look cheap. I wanted it to make it look like you could... I wanted you to actually see the vision that was in my head as best as possible. And so... The best way to do that was to uh, was to add as much detail as possible. Um, add the sling on our arm. You made a viral site for Jurassic. Have you considered making one for Dino Defenders Extreme? Um, I have actually considered that, but the problem there is, is Jurassic, you're talking about a viral site, right? So a viral site is something that goes viral that lots of people view. And Jurassic has the added advantage of being Jurassic, like everyone knows about it. Whereas Dino Defenders, it would be, I don't know, no, no, no. A viral site is meant to be like a build up to something, so you tease what's coming, whereas Dino Defenders, like, a lot of it's already out, so. <laughs> um, there's not really much point in a viral site anymore. And plus, like, I've already got enough on my plate just making the episodes. Let alone a whole viral site on the side. But I am actually figuring. Speaking of websites, I am figuring of making an, a Dino Defenders website, like a specific website that has all the detail and everything on it, so you can go to that website to view everything you need to know about Dino Defenders and watch all the episodes and everything from there. And potentially, if I can organise it, uh, buy a DVD of it. But we'll, we'll see. We're not there just yet, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see if one day... I can uh, make a DVD of it, that, or Blu-ray, even better, but we'll see. Okay. Um, so actually, I just want to play uh, this video of Michael Crichton. So I'm just going to change the volume. Oh, we've got music playing in the background. Uh, let's have a look. I wish I could play it on screen with her. Um, let me just see. Let me just see if I could do something. Um, bear with me. Uh, window capture, is that it? Ah, here we go. So what I might do is if I crop that. There we go. Put that down here. I do, I have bought this. So I bought this from C-SPAN. But I figured... Uh, oh wait, if I go to Photoshop, that's going to go back. That's going to go to Photoshop, isn't it? No? Is it not? Let's have a look. Oh no, because it's window capture. Okay. Bear with me. <laughs> We're getting there. Okay. All right. Let's do this. Let's listen to Michael Crichton uh, talk about the quality of American mass media. Um, I'm just going to bring up the volume of that. Let me know if it's loud enough for you guys. Four, five, zero, four. Can you guys hear this? Next, we take you to the National Press Club in downtown Washington, D.C., where this past Tuesday the club sponsored a luncheon and the guest speaker was author Michael Crichton. Mr. Crichton has authored eight books, including the bestsellers Jurassic Park and Rising Sun. 
His ninth novel is due out in the fall. At this press what are you event, good? Okay. Let's just watch this. Let's just listen to this. quality of the American news media this. in this era of what he terms junk food journalism. Here now is so I think it's quite important for today's up a little, sis. Aaron. Okay, how's that? Is that better? Oh, it went black, but the audio is good. Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is. Did it? Why did it go black? No, it shouldn't. There it is. It's Mick Rude, and I'm a member of the board of uh, governors of the club, and I am the editor of Biotech Daily, a King Publishing Group newsletter. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today as well as those of you who are listening to this program on National Public Radio or watching on C-SPAN. Before introducing our head table, I'd like to yeah, remind going, our members black, of I'll... upcoming speakers. On April we'll 8th, listen. Coretta Scott King will address the club on civil rights in America 25 years after the release of the Kerner Commission report. On April 13th, Henry Cisneros, Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, will discuss the Clinton administration's agenda for urban housing. And on April 23rd, David Mixner, so a gay to rights to advocate, on a, will discuss on a live stream for gays a while as a political force because I think in considering the 1990s. current events, and I know audio like, and video this channel tapes of press isn't club about this sort of stuff, available through the I don't National know, I've Press not heard Club many Library people talk about this video or by calling. One eight hundred nine five two. I figured tape. that would be quite interesting to listen to what Crichton had also, to say back uh, in nineteen ninety three. Also, at our next uh, authors' rap session on April twentieth, Admiral William J. Crow, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, will answer questions about his new book, *The Line of Fire*. If you here have any questions for our speaker, please uh, write them on the cards provided at your table, and pass them up to me. I'll answer as many as I possibly can. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to Maybe stand briefly ahead. while their names are called. Skip ahead. Please withhold your applause until I'm through reading all the names. From your right, Allison Kennedy, senior producer. Then we heard that sexual harassment was the topic. Then again, we... Oh, you know what? I'm going to pause it. Bear with me. Because I realised why it's probably going black is because I'm streaming as well as trying to watch a video. Which isn't good. So, let me pull it up on my computer. Next, we take you to the... Right, and then I'm going to go to the bit where the guy introduced Creighton. Chris. Genetic engineer. Uh, here we go. This is where it begins. When we first started dickering with Dr. Crichton about speaking uh, here last year, and right up until about two or three weeks ago, we thought he would talk about genetic engineering going awry. Then we heard that sexual harassment was the topic. Then again, we were told that Japanese-U.S. relations and the media's role would be the subject. Clearly, this is a man of narrow interests. <laughs> Our guest today is one of those lucky individuals uh, who knew from an early age exactly what he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to be a writer. When he received grades of C and C plus on his English papers at Harvard, he decided it was Harvard and not him, that was an heir. So he conducted a little experiment. For the next assignment, a paper on Gulliver's travels, he retyped an essay by George Orwell and submitted it as his own. Now, obviously, if caught, he would have been expelled for plagiarism. But Michael Crichton, at age 18, was so convinced that the instructor was wrong about writing styles and poorly read as well, <laughs> that he went ahead and took the chance. George Orwell got a B-minus at Harvard. 
I like it. It's like a bit of history. The, into uh, my the experience that prompted uh, Michael Crichton to switch out of English, the English department, uh, and study anthropology. He kept writing and eventually put himself through Harvard Medical School by turning out uh, paperback novels under this uh, pseudonym on the weekends. He wrote a spy thriller in nine days, and his acclaimed work, The Andromeda Strain, was sold to the movies for a lot of money when he was in his last year of medical school. That very public success made it respectable for Crichton to quit medicine, a, de a decision he had earlier likened to quitting the Supreme Court to become a bail bondsman. <laughs> By the time Michael was 30, he thought he had run out of goals. He had a medical degree. He'd published two best-selling no uh, selling novels. He'd made a movie. He'd climbed the Great Pyramid. Other than a premature midlife crisis, what was left? Plenty, it turns out. Never not so clever. This is, Two this of is Michael gold. Crichton's mm -hmm. nine novels, oh, Rising Sun and Jurassic Park, are bestsellers. Each will be in the movie theaters later this year. Steven Spielberg is bringing to life the dinosaurs of Jurassic Park through special effects, including a lizard-like Tyrannosaurus Rex, a the size of this ballroom. <laughs> It promises to be the summer movie. The version, uh, the movie version of Rising Sun is likely to, to stir criticism for Crichton. Movie critics and editorial writers have assailed the book's central thesis that the Japanese government is methodically expanding its domination of American industry. Crichton wrote, wrote uh, Rising Sun as a wake-up call for Americans. But was disturbed when like critics saw it as a racist uh, attack on Japanese. He will address the media's role in the controversy in his talk today. So the media were calling Crichton a racist <laughs> because he was trying Crichton to tell has been called the, fa the, the father of the techno thriller over America. Doesn't that sound quite his similar next to certain is someone today? Is due out in the fall. Who, uh, it is based on the issue of soon to be ex sexual harassment. warning about China. Let's give the very versatile and very prolific Michael Crichton. A warm press club welcome. Thank you, Mick. It's interesting to, uh, to hear these things that you said in the past quoted to you that you don't have any recollection about at all anymore. It's, it's nice that they're funny. <clears throat> I'm here before you today as the author of uh, a novel about dinosaurs, a novel about U.S.-Japan trade relations, and a forthcoming novel about sexual harassment. This is what some people have called my dinosaur trilogy. <laughs> but I wanted to, uh, to talk today about another dinosaur, one that, that I have the strong feeling is on the road to extinction. I'm referring to the American media and I mean extinction literally. In my own mind, it's likely that what we now think of as the mass media will be gone within 10 years. I'm just going to pause it there. Never not so clever at this says, oh shit, that's not the parallel I expect you to make. Well, this is what's interesting about this is following, like I don't want to get it too political, but following American politics for the last four years and knowing Michael Crichton's history, I, was, I, w I kept seeing parallels between the way... Trump was talking about uh, the, the media, talking about China's industry and America taking American industry and all, all this sort of stuff. And I was like, there's too, there's too many parallels. So I wanted to like get this video out there a little bit more, or at least the audio out there a little bit more, because this is basically Michael Crane calling out fake news, uh, you know, way before that term was uh, popular. Um, he calls it junk food journalism in this. Um, but he does make a prediction as he just said there that the American mass media will be gone within 10 years that's kind of not happened but it's, it's not happened within 10 years of this video but it definitely is going that way vanished without a trace yeah, it hasn't vanished there's been evidence trace. of this impending extinction for some time we all know the statistics about the decline in newspaper readership and network television viewership. The polls, which increasingly show negative attitudes in the public toward the, the press and the media, and with good reason. 
A generation ago, Patty Chayefsky's network looked like outrageous farce. Today, when Geraldo Rivera bears his buttocks, when the New York Times misquotes Barbie the doll, and NBC fakes news footage of Chevy trucks, network looks like a documentary. According to recent polls, large segments of the American population think the media is attentive to trivia and indifferent to what really matters. They also believe that the media does not report the country's problems, but instead is a part of them. Increasingly, mm. people perceive no difference between the narcissistic, self-serving reporters asking the questions and the narcissistic, self-serving politicians who refuse to answer. And I'm troubled by the media's response to these criticisms. We hear the old professional line, sure, we've got problems. We could always do our job better. Or there's the time-honored, we've always been disliked because we're the bearer of bad news. It comes with the territory, I'll start to worry when the press is liked. Or after a major disaster like the NBC News fiasco, we hear, this is a time for reflection. These responses suggest to me that the media just doesn't get it, doesn't understand why the consumers are now unhappy with their wares. It reminds me a lot of the story of the man who decided to kill his wife by having a lot of sex with her. Pretty soon you see this beaming, healthy, robust woman followed by a wizened little guy with a cane <laughs> who turns to a friend and says, she doesn't know it yet, but she's only got two weeks to live. <laughs> Michael Crichton was really funny as well. If you ever watch his old In any case, like it's the perception that the media and our current concept of news is outmoded that I would like to address today. So for a moment, let's set aside the usual bromides about the press. Let's take it as given that the bearer of bad news is often executed, that all human beings have an appetite for gossip and scandal, yep. that the media must attract an audience, yep. and that bias is in the eye of the reader as much in the pen or the sound bite of the reporter. Damn straight. And let's talk instead about quality. The media are an industry and their product is information. Along with many other American industries, the American media produce a product of very poor quality. Its information is not reliable, it has too much chrome and glitz, its doors rattle, it breaks down almost immediately, and it's sold without a warranty. It's flashy, but it's basically junk. So people have begun to stop buying it. Poor product quality results in part Lance in the Morris. American educational system which now graduates workers too poorly educated to generate high quality information. Lance Moore says this hits too close to home, especially with current events. Exactly. Like, I, I can't remember when I found this video on C-SPAN, but I bought it because you can buy, if you sign up to C-SPAN, you can request a copy of it to buy, which is why I feel like I'm, I'm okay streaming the audio to talk about it. Um, but yeah, I was listening to this not too long ago and I was like, I need to like, my, sh my channel isn't about this sort of stuff, but because it's Michael Crichton and it's to do with Jurassic... Well, it's not to do with Jurassic Park, but he's the author of Jurassic Park. I figured, feel like I could make that link um, to just sort of get some more ears on this. Just because it just shows, as I said earlier, like how prophetic Crichton is, or was, sorry, yeah, about certain things. Like, he, he was ahead of his time by a long shot. And his global warming... Uh, opinions later on would obviously get him in a, into a lot of heat pun not intended um, but like if he if he was out there today saying these things like this he would be chastised by the media like he wouldn't be well I don't know maybe he wouldn't but like he would be he wouldn't be looked at favourably let's put it that way in part it's a problem of nearsighted management that encourages profits at the expense of quality in part, it's a failure to respond to changing technology. And in large part, it's a failure to recognize the changing needs of the audience. In recent decades, many American companies have undergone the painful wrenching changes that restructuring produces in order to create high quality products. We all know what this requires. Flattening the corporate hierarchy, moving critical information from the bottom up 
instead of the top down. Empowering workers. Changing the system, not just the focus of the corporation. And relentlessly driving toward a quality product. I don't know about flattening the corporate product. hierarchy. I'm, I'm a bit because improved skeptical quality about demands that part a change in the corporate culture. That, that's a whole a different conversation. Change. Generally speaking, the American media has remained aloof from this process. There have been some positive innovations in recent years, like CNN and C-SPAN. But the news on television CNN and newspapers is generally perceived as less accurate, <laughs> less objective, less informed than it was a decade ago. Because instead of focusing on quality, the media have tried to be lively or engaging, selling the sizzle, not the steak, the talk show host, not the guest, mm -hmm. the format, not the subject. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, I would argue it has abandoned its audience. Who will be the GM or IBM of the 90s? The next great institution in America to find itself obsolete and outmoded while obstinately refusing to change? I suspect one answer would be the New York Times and the commercial networks. <gasps> Other institutions have been pushed to improve their quality. From the New York Times under the Ford bus. Ford now makes a better car than it has at any time in my life. And we can thank Toyota and Nissan for that. But who will push the New York Times? The answer, I think, is technology. The media has always been driven by technology, and it's surprising how many of its attitudes and even terminology are very old. Stereotype and cliché or 18th century printer's terms, referring to metal type. The inverted pyramid story structure is a response to the then newly invented telegraph. Reporters were not sure they could get the whole story in before the telegraph broke down, and so they began to send the, the most important information first. The first image broadcast on television was a dollar sign, setting the tone for the future of that medium. But the modern thrust of technology, I would argue, is radically different. Because it is changing the very concept of information in our society. Information today is vitally important. We live by it. We are an information society. For the first time in our history, by the year 2000, 50% of all American jobs will require at least one year of college. In this environment, News isn't entertainment. It's a necessity. We need it. And we need it to be of high quality, comprehensive and factually accurate. More and more, people understand that they pay for information. This is kind of tragic. Online this is kind databases of tragic charged by the minute. Knowing like where it's going and what Michael Crichton wish would happen. <laughs> like it's it's kind of sad to know that like that's where it would end up. In like in today's current climate, he's like he's so hopeful for that. Well, he, he's not necessarily hopeful. He's he's giving warning, but like he wishes it would get better. And I'm with him, but you know, from 1993 to 2021, it's only really gotten worse. As the link between payment and information becomes more explicit, consumers will naturally want better information. You have to bear in mind, like this is before social media came along, so things like Twitter and Facebook where people will be live streaming on the ground and people will become journalists essentially like and then video manipulation deep faking all, all that sort of stuff like none of that was around when he was making this speech so yeah they'll demand it and they'll be willing to pay for it there is going to be I would argue there already is a market for extremely high quality information what quality experts would call Six Sigma information. A Sigma, just as an aside, a Sigma is a standard deviation, and the trendsetter for benchmarking American quality has always been, we've list 10, 10 years or so, Motorola. And Motorola, uh, until about 89, was talking about three Sigma quality, which is 99.7% or, or three bad parts in a thousand. Motorola then made the jump to Six Sigma which is three bad parts in a million. It's a quantum jump, virtually unknown in American business, although the Japanese have been doing it for years. All I'm trying to say here is that this kind <laughs> of rigorous approach to unknown in America... Oh, sorry, just rewound it. Zul says you 
probably need to put quotations when calling the journalists on Twitter. Well, the, the actual journalists on Twitter, I would do that. But like, what I'm saying is like, social media kind of made everyone a journalist. Essentially, like the people who you, all you need is this your phone, you go down to like an event, you film what's going on, you upload it to your social media and then you're basically uh, you know bit recording the current events business although the Japanese have been doing it for years all I'm trying to say here is that this kind of rigorous approach to, to what's being made and how we're doing has never been applied to the media in my own case, when I add up what I spend for newspapers, magazines, books, databases, cable services, and so on, I find that I spend about as much for information, food for thought, as I do for food. I may not be typical, but I'm hardly unique. And I don't pay all this money because I think I'm getting good information. I pay to find out what Ken Kesey used to call the current fantasy, what is being written and brooded about. But what if somebody offered a service with really high quality information. A service where all the facts were true, where the quotes weren't piped, where the statistics were presented by someone who knew something about statistics. What would that be worth? A lot. Because good information has value. The notion that news is filler between the ads is an outdated idea. There's a second and related trend here. I want direct access to the information that interests me and increasingly, I expect to get it. This is a long-standing trend in many technologies. When I was a kid, televisions had no, uh, telephones had no dials. If you wanted to place a call, you picked it up and talked to an operator who placed the call for you. Now, if you've ever had the experience of being in a situation where someone else has to place your calls, you realize how exasperating and frustrating that is. We can all do it faster and better ourselves. Today's media equivalent of the old telephone operator is Dan Rather, or the front page editor, or the reporter who prunes the facts in order to be lively and vivid. Prunes Increasingly, facts, I want to again. remove those filters, and in some cases, I already can. When I read that Ross Perot appeared before a congressional committee, I am no longer solely dependent on the lively and vivid account in the New York Times, which talks about Perot's folksy homilies and Frank Capra, and gives a lot of other flashy chrome trim that I'm not interested in. <laughs> Never not so clever at this. Thank you for the $5 tips. It's thick intelligence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's in reference to thin intelligence, right, by Crichton. Primetime says, How amazing is the Lost World hardcover? Love your stuff. You're all, you always get me back into Jurassic. Well, thank you very much. Yes, the Lost World hardcover, the one with the blue, misty mountains, I really like. <laughs> I can turn on C SPAN and watch the hearing myself. In the process, I can also see how accurate the New York Times account was, and that's likely to change my perception of the New York Times, as indeed it has. Ooh. Because it does seem that the New York Times has a problem with Ross Perot. Ooh. It reminds me of the story about Hearst, who remarked upon seeing an adversary in the street, I don't know why he hates me, I never did him a favor. <laughs> <laughs> but my, uh, my ability to view C-SPAN brings us to the third trend, the coming end of the media's information monopoly. For 200 years since the inception of this nation, the American Revolution was the first war fought in part through op opinion in public newspapers. And Benjamin Franklin was the first media savvy lobbyist to employ techniques of disinformation. For 200 years, the media has been able to behave in a basically monopolistic way. The media has treated information the way John D. Rockefeller treated oil, as a commodity in which the distribution network, rather than product quality, was of primary importance. But once people can get the raw information themselves, that monopoly ends. And that means big changes soon. Once Al Gore gets the fiber optic highways in place and the information capacity of this country is where it ought to be, where it should have been several years ago, then I will be able, for example, to view, view any public meeting of Congress on tape. And I will have artificial intelligence agents roaming the databases, downloading stuff I'm interested in, and assembling for me a front page or a nightly news show 
that addresses my interests. See, that's exactly what happened, basically, because the, the algorithms on like YouTube and social media like follows your like trends like what you or you're interested in so that's why like when you watch a video on youtube especially if you watch something political you'll get a lot of the people who uh like that person in that same sphere and you'll only basically you'll start to live in an echo chamber and Crichton basically just predicted that right there where when he was talking about um you know the information being sorted by ai agents who was basically an algorithm it's just it's just so fascinating listening to this. Never not so clever at this said, let's be clear, one should not uh misconstrued this is Crichton's tactic endorsement for anyone in particular. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not. But either way, like I don't agree with a lot of things Crichton said uh back in the day. But we'll uh Yeah, like I like I said, I don't know if flattening the corporate hierarchy is the answer to, to getting quality news. I don't know, I'd have to think about that more, but I don't know, it sounds a little bit too, uh, I don't know, problematic. Lance Moore says, as someone who doesn't affiliate with any political party, this is some interesting information. Exactly. See, this is the thing. I have I was politically homeless for a lot of years, and, I, and I, I would consider myself in the middle, a centrist. That's where I, if I had to label myself, that's what I would call myself. Like, I like ideas from all sides of the political spectrum. Because humans are humans, you know, they don't just like one thing. You can't just find one person who fits uh, the category of of whatever binary category you want to put them in. And you can't, like, they'll, they'll have nuanced opinions on everything. So it's like, you can't, you can't just box people in. And that's the problem with today's like, sort of political climate. And everything's become political. That's the problem. Like, everything's become political. And it's... Too much labelling, too much, um, too much uh, assuming motives, everything like that. Like you can't, you have to just listen to people and take in what they have to say, and and exactly like what Crichton says, you have to really uh, pay attention to what the media is saying because the media they love to twist the facts to to suit a narrative, and every side of the political spectrum does that. Matchy says, I'm learning more things from this stream than my online class. <laughs> Welcome to the 21st century. Top stories that I want. I'll have short summaries available, and I can double-click for more detail. How will Peter Jennings or McNeil Lair or a newspaper compete with that? They'll fake it all. Sensationalism. So the media institutions will have to change. And of course, I still don't know They won't don't change. Know. They'll double down. That's the problem which means broad-based overviews or interpretive sources. Uh, David says, I've just come in, who is talking? That's Michael Crichton, author of Jurassic Park. Never not so clever, this says, what happens when you uh, democratize propaganda? Well, that's the thing, that's the way it's going. It's like, there's gonna be, I mean, there's, the problem with the media is, is like, especially with things like, you know, Silicon Valley banning things like parlor and stuff it's like you they're just they're forcing people into their echo chambers and that's that's dangerous that's a problem this will have value but only if these sources engage in genuinely high quality interpretive work or genuinely high quality investigative work at the moment neither occurs very often on the contrary, superficiality is the norm, and everybody in the world knows it. When Barry Lopez went to a, a remote Eskimo village in 1986, one of the residents asked him how long he was staying. Before he could answer, another Eskimo jumped in and said, one day, newspaper story, two days, magazine story, five days, book. <laughs> Even in the Canadian Northwest, the audience seems to be way ahead of the press. Moving closer to home, let's consider some questions that journalists have really recently asked public figures. I invite you to guess the answers. Mr. Cantor, are you a protectionist? No. Mr. Christopher, do you think your middies trip was a waste of time? No. <laughs> Mr. Aspen, 
Do you think we'll really see homosexuals accepted in the military? Yes. Mr. Stephanopoulos, did the White House treatment of Kimba Woods hurt the administration? No. <laughs> Mr. Reich, do you think the Clinton stimulus package will do enough to create jobs? Yes. <laughs> there are two points to be made here. The first is that the structure of the questions dictates the answer. Because no one is going to say that he's a protectionist or a time waster, or that he's promoting policies that will fail. The more important point is that such questions assume a simplified either-or version of reality to which no one really subscribes. In the real world, no one is a protectionist. Because in the real world, there's no such thing as a free market. Haven't you noticed how many free market advocates want tenure? So what we really want to know from Mr. Cantor is not some general that, characterization of his approach, because that characterization that, well, is we'll sim too simplistic to be useful. The line. What we want to know is his thinking on specific trade issues. Even to say, what's your approach on Japan, is too simplistic, because it's highly unlikely that Mr. Cantor thinks the same way about semiconductors, automobile parts, rice, and flat panel displays. No simple answer will satisfy the complex questions he faces, and no one imagines it does except the press. This is one reason why so many people who regularly interact with the press come to view it as an anomaly in their lives. They go about their daily work, which is specific and complex, and then they meet with the press where interactions are general and oversimplified. Why? One answer is that it's very easy for the press to behave this way. You don't have to be knowledgeable about trade to ask Mickey Cantor if he's a protectionist. In fact, this you don't have to up, know... Mo this bit coming up is great, because Michael Crane basically assumes the role of how a journalist... Or, 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 like, I say journalist. I'm not saying every journalist, but, like, how the junk food journalist's mind operates in terms of getting a puff piece out on a serious subject... Uh, Without knowledge, uh, without any prior knowledge to the subject they're about to ask questions about, and it, and it's like I feel like he hits the nail on the head. Doctor Aaron Cooler said he didn't see China coming though, did he? Well, no, I don't know if you were here for the earlier stream, but he was talking about Japan, and it was the exact same sort of scenario. He was talking about Japan taking American jobs, the Japanese taking American jobs, and he wrote Rising Sun as like a warning to America to say like you know your industries could move overseas if you're not careful and all this sort of stuff and then he and then he said and he'll talk about this again in a bit like he got lambasted and called a racist for doing that so <laughs> where have we heard that before one answer is that it's very easy for the press to behave this way you don't have to be knowledgeable about trade to ask mickey Cantor if he's a protectionist in fact you don't have to know much to ask any question that that takes the general form of are we doing enough or are we going too fast or too slow? Or is it fair? Or is it really the best way to go about it? I would argue this whole journalistic procedure is a way to conceal institutional incompetence. Consider the following. Here we go. I don't know very much about the military and I don't follow it. Someone says to me, okay, Crichton, you're doing an interview with Les Aspen. You have two hours to prepare. What am I gonna ask? Well, let's see. Um, I know he's been in the hospital for some reason. I'll inquire about his health, but I don't want to be obvious, so I'll frame it as a national security issue. Are you fit to do the job? And uh, let's see. Oh, I'll ask him about base closings. Uh, are there too many? Is it happening too fast? Is the process fair? Then I'll ask him about defense conversion. Are we doing enough for unemployed engineers? Is it happening too slow? Is, is the process fair? Now let's see, um, wa uh, waste and procurements, wasn't there a $600 toilet seat? I, I know it was a few years ago, but it's always good for a few minutes. <laughs> then, uh, then the Soviet Union, should we be downsizing so fast with all the uncertainty in the world? Then I'll ask him about gays in the military. Was Clinton's approach wise? Is this the, really the best way to go about it? And that should do it. Unfortunately, that is the standard Les Aspen interview. But my point is, I don't know anything about the military. 
I managed to do this interview because the questions are structured very generally. This generality creates a fundamental asymmetry between subject and journalist, and ultimately between journalist and audience. Les Aspen has to know much more detail. He has to address very specific pressures to carry out his job. But I can frame very general questions and get away with doing mine. How do I justify my position? Well, I can tell myself that I'm too busy to do better because the news rushes onward. But that's not really satisfactory. Better to say the American people don't want details. They just want the basics. In other words, I can blame my own shoddy behavior on the audience. And if I hear the audience criticizing me, I can say I'm being blamed as the bearer of bad news. Instead of what is really going on, which is that my customers are telling me that my product is poorly researched and often either uninteresting or irrelevant. It's junk food journalism, empty calories. The media's tendency to be general instead of specific has many unhappy consequences. It is inherently superficial. It's also inherently speculative because it focuses on attitudes, what a person thinks, and not on what they do. But what a person thinks is far less important than what they do, particularly because the two are very often contradictory. And the tendency to characterize a person... That's the trick to knowing, like, politics in general, um, and also the me and the media. Like, Michael Crane basically just hit the nail on the head there. It's always, like... It's always about what people do, not what they say. And the things, things like Twitter and social media is people say a lot and then people start to believe that what they say is what they do and they don't look any further than the tweet or, or the headline or the puff piece or whatever. You know, it's always, you've got to, if you, if you really want to know what's happening, you just look at what people do and then that, that reflects their motives in reality. So, like, a politician or, or a public figure like Crichton might say something, and then the media will say that they're doing something, and it's like, that's not exactly true. <laughs> Just because they say it doesn't mean that's what they're doing, you know? And people say all sorts of things, you know? So that's, like, a really crucial part of the, the thing there. person's beliefs, instead of focusing on their actions, is one of the true abuses of the power of the media. And they're still Look doing how it. quickly Kimba Woods was transformed from respected jurist to Playboy Bunny. Just as I went from normal author to racist Japan basher. In my case, what was striking was how many journalists applied the Japan bashing label without appearing to have read my book. The hazards of this practice became clear in a few months when the Columbia Journalism Review reported last December that the term Japan bashing was invented by an American public relations flack at the Japan Economic Institute, which is an organization run by the Japanese Foreign Ministry. The term was promoted as a way to stifle debate, including legitimate debate, on relations with Japan. Like, could you imagine if Crichton had like a Twitter account and everyone was going after him calling him a racist Japan basher because he wrote this book like cancel Crichton would be the hashtag but it's like no if you read the book that's not what it's about so Zul says hmm sounds like a familiar situation that kind of happened in the Jurassic World fan community recently that became rather obnoxious when it pushed as facts when it's not really proven mm hmm Lance Moore says Republicans and Democrats are the same. They react one time to an event and it automatically becomes the truth to them and they choose to believe it and react to it. The thing about the Republicans and the Democrats is they're sort of like this two sides of the same coin and they're always trying to fight to have the coin flipped so they're face up. That's the best little quick analogy I can I can say. <laughs> Harrison said what happened in the Jew community and he went Jurassic World, not Jew and he was like, sorry, autocorrect. <laughs> uh, and Dr. Erica says they're both idiots. Well they're both just fighting for for political control, aren't they? And it's like they'll always say this is the thing, like 
Like, it's like when Trump came out the other day after he got banned off Twitter and he was saying to the press, he was like, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been predicting this for years, you know, this sort of thing, I've been saying it, and it's like, well, why didn't you do anything? That's the thing, he said it a lot, but he didn't actually do anything about it, and that's, uh, and I don't know if, whether that's because he had some political hurdles that he couldn't get over, but... I guess Trump's not the sort of person to be nuanced and and clear about what he's trying to talk about but it's what you do not what you say so you know I I don't know and so that's what politics basically if someone enters politics without that in mind you know with the mindset of like I'm going to do the best I'm going to do this I'm not going to fall for like saying something and then not doing it and all this sort of stuff by the end of it they do that because that's what the nature of politics brings to the surface in a person it's like you, all these promises and then there's all this red tape they have to get through if they want to make that promise and most of the time they just give up um, some stuff always gets through in that but it's it's always an ebb and flow you know you know it's you know why do they call it left wing and right wing why do you think they call it that it's because it's a wing it's 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 what makes the bird fly. So if one one wing is in more power than the other, like you got to try and keep the the country afloat, or whatever country it is in, every country basically, with um with sort of the left right divide in its politics. So it's you know they ebb and they ebb and flow uh, all the time to keep things afloat. But if obviously if one wing is flapping more than the other in this analogy the bird isn't going to be flying very coherently and it's going to be all over the place <laughs> and that's that's basically how politics works uh yeah i know the wings are in reference to the french court never not so clever at this but i was saying like in my analogy you can you can use the wing the right being the sports of the king and the cl- clergy yes yes and the left was the people well yeah yeah that's because um what is it i mean that makes sense because right the right tends to uh, respect hierarchy, whereas the left respects, uh, I don't know, there you go, order and chaos, that's the kind of thing. But the, the right tends to forget that too much order leads to authoritarianism, and then the left doesn't realise that chaos is chaotic, but you need a bit of chaos to keep the hierarchies in check it is the way it all basically it's the, you can boil it down to that it sounds cheesy but like that yin yang symbol and that's why it's like you've just got to ride that line in between as best as possible that's what everyone should be doing who's not a politician <laughs> Dr. Anacle says at the end of the day they both have to do the same job anything else is just a taste that leaves in your mouth yeah exactly <laughs> You're a member of the Bull Moose Party. <laughs> anyway. The man who coined the phrase said, anyone who uses that term is my intellectual dupe. Worse still, characterization lies at the heart of the impulse to polarize every issue, what we might call the crossfire syndrome. We're all assumed these days to reside at one extreme of the opinion spectrum or the other. We are pro-abortion or anti-abortion, nothing in between. We are free traders or protectors. We're all assumed these days to resolve accusation. I've just, I've just rewound it a couple of things because this is where he starts talking about like people being boxed into into categories. And obviously if you listen to what he says here and then reflect, obviously because hindsight is twenty twenty, reflect on like the way people act on social media to each other, then you'll start to see it starts to make a lot more sense lies at the heart of the impulse to polarize every issue, what we might call the crossfire syndrome. We're all assumed these days to reside at one extreme of the opinion spectrum or the other. We are pro-abortion or anti-abortion, nothing in between. We are free traders or protectionists, nothing in between. We are pro-private sector or pro-big government. We are feminists or chauvinists. But in the real world, few of us hold these extreme views. There is instead a spectrum of opinion. The extreme positions of the crossfire syndrome require extreme simplification, which often leads to framing the debate in terms which ignore the real issues. 
For example, when I watch Crossfire or Nightline or McNeil Lair, I often think, wait a minute. The real issue isn't term limits, it's campaign finance reform. The real issue isn't whether a gasoline tax is regressive, it's national security. Whether we prefer to go back to war in the Gulf instead of reducing oil consumption by taxing it more heavily as every other nation does. The real issue isn't whether the U.S. should have an industrial policy, it's whether the one that we have, because no policy is a policy, whether that policy serves us well. The issue isn't whether Mickey Cantor is a protectionist, it's how the U.S. should respond to its foreign competitors. All this reminds me of the, of the riddle that Abraham Lincoln used to ask, you probably know this, he said, how many legs does a dog have if you include the tail as a leg? And the answer is four, because the tail is not a leg, even if you say it is. <laughs> the polarization of issues has contributed greatly to our national paralysis, because it posits false choices. Did you hear what you just said there? The polarization, let me, let me get that up again. What did, what, I want to be specific. The polarization of issues has contributed greatly to our national paralysis. The polarization of issues has contributed greatly to our national paralysis. He did say national, right? He didn't say. The polarization of issues has contributed greatly to our national paralysis. How much have we heard that being said every time? Like, if you look at the news, everyone, oh, we live in such a divided time. It's such a, oh, God, it's never been more divided than today. It's like, yeah, you, everyone's been saying that for years. That's the that's the, the issue. I just don't believe it. I believe, like, people, people are not divided. They agree more on, on most things. It's only that they focus on the things that they disagree on, which is a very minute uh, problem. And I, part of my thoughts go to, it's because we live in such privileged societies that we have time to think about the really complicated subjects that really you can't really have an answer for. Um, you know, abortion being one of them as an example, which is what Crichton brought up. It's like the. There's so much nuance with that subject, and there's so much, so many uh, uh, opinions floating around, and people get so hectic about it. It's like if you didn't talk about that subject, you, the two people having the argument about that subject might actually get on <laughs> because they like agree on everything else. So, yeah, Doctor Aaron Cool says we live in the least divided time. Yeah, right. I'd, I'd much agree with that sentiment. I, I, I agree more with that sentiment, sorry. Because it posits false choices which stifle the kind of a debate that's essential for change to occur. It's ironic that this should happen. But it's funny because he says like national paralysis and it's like that's what they're saying about like America today. They're like, oh, we can't get past this this divide amongst people. And it's like you're talking about the the yelling and the screaming that's been exacerbated from the from the from the fringe, uh, but basically the fringe people on both sides of the political spectrum who have exacerbated their voices through social media. So it feels it'll feel like it's gotten worse, but it hasn't really. At a time of great social upheaval in our country, when we need more than ever to be able uh, thank to you, big experiment shark. with different Sorry, viewpoints. Uh, but in the media world, a previously established Friends, idea like an incumbent thank you so much for the tip as well, man. enjoys Love a tremendous advantage over Appreciate it child. every time. Thank Hence, you. the familiar You're ideas the continue to be God repeated speed. long past their demonstrated validity. More than two decades after right brain, left brain thinking was discredited in scientific circles, those metaphors are still casually repeated in the media. After 30 years of government efforts to banish racism, Persistent racial inequality suggests the need for fresh perspectives. Those perspectives are rarely heard. And, and more than three decades after the women's movement began amid, amid media ridicule, the men's movement finds itself ridiculed in exactly the same way, oh. often by leading feminists, who appear to have learned little from their own ordeals. Oh, Crichton. 
This leads me to the final consequence of generalization. It characterizes our opponents as well as the issues. There has been a great decline in civility in this country. We have lost the perception that reasonable persons of goodwill may hold opposing views. Like, you listen to what he's saying there, and this is in 1993, so when people romanticize the 90s, they're like, oh, I hate living in this time. It's so tiresome. I wish I could go back to live in the 90s. It's like, yeah, if you, if you, if you were living in the 90s, this sort of rhetoric was still going around. It just wasn't on social media, and you would only have mainstream media outlets to get your news from, so you it would feel like everything's more okay. Well, it'd feel like everything's going more stably because you're getting one side of the of the story which has been skewed uh, and people like Crichton on C-SPAN are the ones blowing the whistle saying like no <laughs> you know it's 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 basically it, politics has basically been the same forever simultaneously we've Tribalism. lost the ability to address Tribalism. reasoned arguments to forsake ad hominem characterization and instead address another person's views which is a tragedy, because debate is interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a form of exploration. God damn right. But personal attack is merely unpleasant and intimidating. Paradoxically, this decline in civility and good humor, which the press appears, apparently appears to believe is necessary to get the story, reduces the intensity of our national discourse. Watching British parliamentary debates, I noticed that the tradition of saying the right honorable gentleman or my distinguished friend before hurling an insult, there's something very interesting to the process. A civil tone actually permits more bluntness. <laughs> so, my distinguished friends, I hope, <laughs> I hope that this era of polarized junk food journalism will soon come to an end. For too long, the media has accepted the immortal advice of Yogi Berra, who said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> but business as usual doesn't serve the audience anymore. And although technology will soon precipitate an enormous change in the media, we face a more immediate problem, a period of major social change in this country. We're going to need a sensitive, informed, and responsive media to accomplish those changes. And that's the way it is. And Thank you're you not going to get it. <laughs> you're not going to get it right. I think you can take some questions from the audience now. But I, I got know. another one for you. This isn't over till it's over. <laughs> I'm almost afraid to ask him a question. Fortunately, uh, most of them, if not all of them, were asked by members of the audience. Mr. Crichton, will your next novel be a success? <laughs> Seriously, now. Uh, There's still uh, 20 minutes left. What can a left. reporter who largely agrees with your criticisms of the press do to change the nearsighted visions of his... Do you want me to continue with the Q&A section? There's 20 minutes of it, or do you want me to uh, to stop and go back to the way things are? Lance says, honestly, people who say, I wish I was born earlier, don't know how good they've got now, America-wise. Uh, we're probably more free than ever, but then again, freedom is just another word for chaos. <laughs> yeah, well. Yes, never lost the clever this says. Continue. Okay. His right. editors, a vision of his editors. I'll continue. When every suggested attempt at quality improvement falls on deaf ears. We're asking advice. Yeah. Very, very tough problem. You know, uh, W. Edwards Deming said that in general, 85% of quality, quality problems are, are uh, at the feet of management. He's probably about right. Uh, I think that there are things that you, that you can lobby for, but um, it's a very difficult problem. And I understand very well uh, that people in your position um, are often blamed for, for a system that is out of your control. It's like, it's like blaming um, American automobile workers for lousy American cars. It's not their problem. They didn't build the line. They didn't set it all up. They didn't engineer the cars, but they're stuck. So I understand that. Can't help you.
Uh, your vision of a quality information publication is grand, but it would reach or appeal to but a very few. If you doubt me, consult most any readership survey. Okay, this, this reminds me of the, of the time-honored discussion, which I, I certainly faced when I set out to write a, a novel about uh, economic issues. The time-honored view that Americans aren't interested in economics, they don't care, they won't pay attention to it, that's why we can't put it on television, that's why we can't put it in newspapers. And along comes Ross Perot with a couple of charts and a pointer, and he, and he you know, gets a larger audience in the World Series. Yeah, there's a certain level where I think that people believe something isn't true and they haven't tried it. You know, and, and that view is something for which I have very little sympathy. The other thing is that what I'm trying to express to you, I think, is that there is a segment of, of your audience which is migrating upward very fast and which is looking for sources of, of better and better information. Yeah, and the, and the notion everyone, of the lowest though. common denominator, which, which very often is, is, you know, is kind of subtext of any, any discussion, the lowest common denominator isn't going to cut anymore. You know, I mean, if we want to talk about the problems of having a two-tiered society, that's another discussion. We do have a two-tiered society. It is a problem. But meanwhile, the, the users of information that are really able to, to, to use it are, are pushing in another direction. And the lowest common denominator is of no interest. It sounds as if you've been burned by the press. Doesn't even sound that way. Is your personal experience with the media uh, criticism uh, dri the driving force behind your analysis of the news business? Well, <clears throat> yes and no. <laughs> That's a good answer. Is it? Um, uh, you see, I have two experiences. One is that I alternate uh, in, in my ordinary life between uh, being the subject of your attentions and then going and doing in, in some form uh, something very similar to the job that you do. So I experience not only in this alternating okay. way... I've got this uh, frame done. ...the effect of being at the, at the receiving end of your attentions, but I also have a chance to see what's happening to the people that I'm talking to and how they are progressively treating me as a journalist, as a member of the press, who's coming to ask them questions. And, and all that is changing uh, dramatically. It's very much more difficult for me to get people to talk to me than it was uh, at some time in the past. And in fact, since I seem to be more of a celebrity, you think it'd be easier. But it's harder because there's increasingly strong... Well, don't they, Lance, don't they call it the press, not because they keep pressing you, but because of the printer press, like presses onto the paper, the ink, right? Is that right? attitudes about if you're a journalist I don't want to deal with you because I know what kind of a person you are you're coming in with an agenda you're gonna ask me stupid questions you're gonna write up stuff that isn't true and you're gonna make me look like a fool and I understand how people can come to feel that way uh, but now I'm trying to do the job <laughs> and I and I'm only experiencing the sort of difficulties that are there so could you give us some examples of uh some mistreatment you have suffered in the media. Oh, gosh. <laughs> hmm. Oh, you're mucking uh, about. Okay, the, okay, yeah. I guess the easiest way to talk about this is to say that at a certain point, the, 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 oh, actually, there's a wanna... frightening thing that's going on now, which is that in, in some odd way, we are going back to a 19th century sense of reputation. You know, where, where one's reputation picture. exists, it has value, and it's important, and one fears for it to be damaged. And, and I am, for example, very aware that however successful my books are, and, and, and they are very successful, many more people will see the newspaper headlines than will ever read the books. Many more people will take the skimmed surface of what is said about me than, than will... Um, see those things. So that, for example, all, I have many Japanese friends who, um, although they read English, are not comfortable about it. And, and for a period of six months between the publication in the United States of Rising Sun and the, and the Japanese translation, they were uneasy. You know, they were saying, you know, people are coming to me saying I shouldn't be your friend because you say all these terrible things about Japanese people. And Cancel Crichton, am I right? <laughs> like, oh my word. Like, 
if you just listen to that story, it sounds like it could have happened yesterday, and it could have been some sort of Twitter controversy or some non-troversy. Um, you know, I, the Japanese restaurant where I eat lunch every day, one day, one day the guy who, who owns it came over with a copy of the LA Times and said, is this you? You know, um, <laughs> This said, you? Yes, it was. And I, I had to, I was one of the earliest consumers of uh, translated copies of my own book because I had to send them to all these people so that they could see what it was all about. And they, of course, went, no, it's true. <laughs> in view of increasing demands on people's time, doesn't a large segment of the public demand uh, increasingly, or depend increasingly, on analysts as filters? The whole notion, <clears throat> the, the whole notion of compression, I, I think, is 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 suspect at the point when you begin to, to recognize that there, that there are subject areas for all of us where we're very interested and we want to know a lot, areas where we want to know a certain amount, areas where we just want, in essence, headlines. And, and all those things vary. And the, the notion that I don't have the time to pay attention to what is of interest to me is a false notion. I mean, what matters to me the things that affect my ability to work, the things that affect my income, the things that, you know, the, the, the subjects that I'm involved with, whatever that may be. I mean, all the time that it takes. You know, and, and what I'm trying to say back to you is that very often I have a heck of a hard time in the traditional mass media getting the information in, in a, a good enough form. And I think I'm not the only person who feels that way. You are driving this old copy editor crazy. Sometimes you use a plural verb with the word media, and sometimes you use a singular verb. <laughs> Which is it? Thank you very much. Um, at, at, <laughs> at a late point in writing this speech, I went through and made, made media plural throughout. But as I speak, what can I say? It's, You've all, you know, you have to deal with transfers. It's difficult. Fair enough. Aren't politicians, including the president, responsible for simplification and polarization of the public, uh, various public debates on various issues? Yes and no. You know, I think that, I think that polarization is a trick that works for lots of people. Um, it, it's a way of heightening attention. It's a way of exaggerating all kinds of things. It's a way of, it's a way of trying to get people to cross the line. But, uh, but you know, in the real world, it's not always the Alamo. You know, I mean, uh, life isn't isn't like that. And, and in a tremendous number of, of social decisions that our country Just faces, we're that. unable to do it. You know, I mean, I. Oh, I'm always yeah, struck continue. by the notion that, that Catholic countries like France and Italy can come to a conclusion about abortion, whereas the United States cannot. You know, uh, and I think at some point the reality that we have to, to face is what E.J. Downs says, that, that we are presented with extremes, whereas the truth is that the majority of Americans are all somewhere in the middle you know, maybe in one direction or another. And yet we're not acknowledging that. We're not dealing with that. We're not making room for that. And it's very hard, you know, if, it, you know, if my choices Hello. are either... Pause it. Hello? Oh, you're getting that. Look at her. <laughs> She's cool with stripes. Yeah. She's in her stripes. <laughs> She's got to get the chair. Right. Anyway, I just missed what he said. Let me go back. We're not acknowledging that. We're not dealing with that. We're not making room for that. And it's very hard. You know, if, it, you know, if my choices are either to be entirely in favor of abortion without any limitation or any education at all, or entirely against abortion ever, no matter what the medical circumstances at all, then it's going to be hard for me to make a decision. I don't like either one. There you go. In your book, Rising Sun, I sometimes found awkward or unnecessary Japanese expressions, e.g., 
calling the junior person Kohai. Did you write them on your own, or did you ask a native Japanese to translate? Do, did you realize there are many readers, both Americans and Japanese, who understand Japan, the Japanese language and possibly might be disturbed by it? Long question, I'll leave it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I had actually three translators at the point where I realized that, that um, it was very difficult to to get it clear, and I was advised at an early point that what we're talking about is that the two policemen in Rising Sun uh, have what is called a senpai kohai relationship, and and the the senior man, the senpai, refers to the junior man as kohai, which does not happen. I mean, he has that, but he he would never be referred to that way in speech. Uh, I had a different problem, you know, which was that I'm writing a book for an American audience, and 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 so I um, took this liberty. And, and I would say, by the way, that how I think about, uh, this is the second book that I've done, which is, uh, addresses in some way a, another culture. I also did a book about Victorian England. And when the book was sent to the English publishers, they got very disturbed. You know, they said, well, it's just not right. And, uh, and I think many Japanese have perceived that it's just not right. And, and I think that we can have a sense of that. I don't know if any of you have ever read um, Westerns that are written by British authors, you know, where, where, where the, the cowboys always end up saying things like, right you are, partner. And, <laughs> you know, we have that, that distinct sense that it's just off, you know, maybe off a little bit, maybe off a lot. But, um, but it's clearly done by someone who is not a member of this culture who isn't immersed in that and who doesn't have a true feel for it. What can I say? I'm not Japanese, I'm not British. Uh, w one does the best one can. But in some way, it's kind of interesting, if you're knowledgeable, to see where the mistakes are. In your novel, Jurassic Park, you warn against dangerous uh, genetic engineering. Did you, did you consider yourself, or do you consider yourself, in the same camp as activist Jeremy Rifkin, who is currently campaigning against engineered tomatoes? Why or why not? Hmm, good extreme question. Um, <laughs> well, at least I view Rifkin as an extreme person. <clears throat> the, the, I have a slightly different view of this, because the, the problem with genetic engineering, as I, as I mentioned in the book, is that unlike previous fundamental technologies in science, for example, atomic technology. Uh, it's very broad-based. It's very inexpensive. I mean, you're soon going to have little old ladies in tennis shoes in their backyards using genetic engineering techniques to grow roses. Uh, it's not a difficult thing at all. You can buy kits for it in the back of Science Magazine. And this makes it very different from, from atomic technology, which really requires a government you know, to, to be able to do it. You need that much money, you need to build huge plants. This is not something that you can do in your basement. Genetic engineering, for better or worse, is. It's being done all around the world for a tremendous number of companies and a tremendous number of reasons. And the notion of how to control it, it seems to me, therefore must address its nature. And unless we can start to have scientists themselves who are more thoughtful and who are, who are forming peer groups, and who are beginning to consider to animate what directions hand this research ought to go in. And I would tell you and I've got a that I certainly had conversations with some in the sling, uh, people so. in genetic engineering who have told me that they have turned away from lines of research themselves and, and don't care any longer about the traditional notion that scientists have had, which is, I might as well do it because if I can think of it, so can someone else, and someone else will sooner or later do it, so why don't I do it? These people are taking a different view, which is that some lines of research are inherently too dangerous, and let's not. And if someone else does, too bad, but I won't do it. And I think we're going to see more and more of those attitudes. I hope so. Is there a parallel between the biotech uh, analogy or genetic engineering industry and the nuclear industry in that both are surrounded by some people who might be called extremists, and that both, perhaps, uh, nuclear in the past, biotech today, have become a little smug, be like a little overconfident, up. and a little uh, fascinated by the science without thinking about its ramifications. Short answer is yes. The, um, 
the, the handling of fundamental technologies is, is a, a very difficult problem. One of the things that I wanted to do in Jurassic Park, or one of the themes that I wanted to play with, is that what we've seen over and over again, for example, in Three Mile Island and in Chernobyl, it isn't that the engineers were too dumb to build in safety systems. They built them in. But the people turned them off. Right. You know, now, now you have a different sort of problem if you say, well, we have a safety system, but it can't ever be turned off. That doesn't seem like a good idea. Um, under what circumstances ought it to be turned off? Um, you know, I, I don't think there are simple answers to, to any of this. And what I felt in the, in the early years of the nuclear power controversy in this country was that we weren't uh, having a very informed discussion about uh, the two prongs of this issue, or the th really there are three. One is, what are you going to do with the waste? No good answer. Second one is, is you know, exactly how hazardous is this technology, and, and, and um, what are the ways that we can uh, control those hazards? For example, uh, very often, a I'm just gonna German or Japanese editing. construction uh, firm will come in to build a nuclear plant, and they will guarantee it. An American firm will not. Okay, uh, what are they doing that we're not doing? What's what, what is there to know about that? Third thing is, what are the alternatives? You know, I, I often said that that in the decision not to use nuclear uh, power in this country, which was around the time of um, um, that movie Michael Douglas did, uh, the China Syndrome, that that uh, all that that was really demonstrating was that trees don't vote in this country, because. Uh, your alternative, which is to use uh, coal power, is going to produce a lot of acid rain, a lot of uh, warming, a lot of other kinds of difficulties that we don't have good solutions to either. So instead of facing a problem which is really balanced between difficult alternatives, you know, we'd all like to have um, energy without any pollution. But in fact, there are problems with every source of energy. And I, and I was recently reading an article about wind power where somebody was complaining about the visual pollution that comes from all these propellers on the hillsides. <laughs> uh, back to Jurassic Park again. Does the Spielberg production focus closely on the biotech aspect? Uh, will the movie spark a fear of the technology? <laughs> That's an interesting question, considering Jurassic Park wasn't even out yet. Someone worrying about the people going against genetic technology because of Jurassic Park and will the film focus on it and it's like mm, nope it's going to be an adventure movie <laughs> no the the movie version of Jurassic Park is not much of a text on biotechnology uh, the Spielberg version focuses on the dinosaurs and I think uh, it, I doubt very much that anyone will be afraid of biotechnology as a result of the movie I think a lot of people may be afraid of dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> to the extent that you have this fear, um, you're on your own. Genetically engineered dinosaurs. How much research did you do uh, we go, so in writing Jurassic Park, and how did you go about doing it? Actually... I'm very interested in the questions that I'm asked about research in general. Uh, because it seems to, to uh, convey to me a sense that, it, that it's not clear exactly what I do. I'm often asked, for example, if I went to Costa Rica when I was working on Jurassic Park, because that's where it's set. The answer is no, and I don't know any reason why I should go. Um, I didn't go to, to Tokyo when I was writing Rising Sun, a novel that's set entirely in Los Angeles. Um, in the case of Jurassic Park, the biggest problem, in, in fact, was to make the dinosaurs. And uh, if you think about it, you know, it's, it's a very uphill problem to get groups of adults, and in a sense even worse children, to believe in dinosaurs on a page even for a couple of hours. You know, we all know, unlike some of the other things that I've written, you know, the Andromeda strain about a satellite that comes back with a plague. Hello, and we all have somewhere a feeling, well, that could be true. But we're all certain that there aren't any dinosaurs. So for me to try and convince you of that concept is a, is, a, is a large problem, and I spent a lot of time doing it. 
the 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 thing that I didn't okay. know so until I actually right got there was, of course, there's absolutely no information about the behavior of dinosaurs at all that's really known. In any, I mean, no one knows a thing about their appearance. No one knows a thing about their their skin texture, skin color, social behavior. We have some deductions. We have some ideas, but nothing is known. So in, in my work, I used a tremendous number of illustrators, who I all thanked in the back of the book, and I looked at all those pictures and tried to make up the behavior. I also did, a, I, I guess I do a certain kind of acting out, because one day my secretary came in, and I think she thought I was having a seizure. I was sitting at my typewriter going, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, what I was doing was trying to get, you know, raptor movements right. <laughs> Okay, Could I have a back brief sure. answer on this, but a quality answer? We're running out of time. Uh, biotechnology has been singled out by the Clinton administration as one of the country's most vital industries. Do you agree with that assessment? Yes, it is. There's absolutely no question about it. It's a, it's a tremendously powerful right. uh, so technology. Just, it it uh, holds the, uh, you know, the good part is it can change almost every aspect next. of our lives, from from what we what we wear to how we live to. Um, what medicines we have to what diseases we're subject to. The bad part is it can change almost every aspect of our lives, and there are some very frightening scenarios, but I believe in it. Before I ask the last question, I'd like to give you a certificate of appreciation and a copy of the book, The North American Indians, a beautifully illustrated volume. I hope you'll agree. Last question. <laughs> what was your first pseudonym? It was John Lang. Uh, I, uh, my first name is John. John Lang, that's and it, And yeah. as a child, I'd enjoy the, the books of Andrew Lang, who was collected fairy tales. Okay. And so I thought that I was writing fairy tales for adults, so I took John Lang. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, it's provocative. Okay, I think that's it. There's a minute left, but I don't think he talks at all. So, yeah, there we go. That was uh, Michael Crichton talking about the American press and uh, and answering some Q and A. So I just thought I thought I'd want to highlight that. You know, I don't know. That's not the sort of thing I would usually highlight, um, but I figured it would be kind of cool to listen to that. And maybe I'll look for some other stuff with Crichton, um, and we can listen to stuff in the future. But um, that's just one of those things I don't hear. I hear obviously a lot of Jurassic Park fans talking about Crichton and, and his relationship to Jurassic Park and all that sort of stuff, but the man himself was really interesting and, and a great sort of had a great foresight into sort of the dangers of what could come in the future. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I'm just going to quickly nip to the toilet and then I will be back. So please bear with me. I'll be right back.
back. Um, put some music on. Uh, see you later, Dr. Aaron Cooler. Um, I'll turn this music down in my ear. Yeah, hopefully that was uh, interesting enough for today's stream. Something a little bit different as well compared to what we usually do. Uh, now, do I want to draw Rose again? I don't know. What other, what other frames have I got to do? Um, wait, did I finish that one? Did I finish this frame? Yes, I did. So I don't know if I want to draw rows again. Um, I'm going to finish the stream 15 minutes earlier because I've got to do something with my family. So uh, we got it's 11:06 right now, and I'll finish at 11:45. Uh, you know what? I actually really need to do a watercolor. Maybe I will have to do Rose again. Uh, oh, maybe not. Let me. I'm just going to see if I can open up a file from ages ago. So bear with me. Let's see. What's this frame? No, that's not that one. Characters chopper. See, the problem is, I think I accidentally, ages ago, like I accidentally deleted <laughs> a lot of my files for episode one, and that's not good. But then again, I don't know if I, I don't know if I did. Let me see. Yeah, I think I did. And I really need the background for roses. Oh no, it might be in a different file. So, uh, yeah, I'm uh, sorry I have to uh, finish this stream earlier. Um, and this isn't going to be very interesting for you guys, but I'm just going to be sort of file hunting. Uh, so bear with me. I'm going to have to look into a, an external hard drive on my laptop. I think I found all the files again, so we'll see. Harrison asked, so the dinosaurs that are in Dino Defenders Extreme are Camarasaurus, Kentrosaurus, what, whatever Cornelius is, which is a... a Proceratosaurus, Megaraptor, Tanistrophius, and what else? Uh, Megalosaurus. Megalosaurus is another one. Right, let me just, I'm just going to have a look for this file. Um, let's have a look.
This is this uh, external hard drive I'm looking on is like super messy. <laughs> well, it's kind of half messy, half not, but the the messiness of it is messy. So, and there's like five different folders of Dino Defenders Extreme. I swear there was like a backup folder. Yeah, sorry about this guys, bear with me. This is important. Uh, it's better I find it now really than later. I swear I found this folder that was like all all the old stuff. You know, I'm probably just going to have to find it later. Um, maybe I'll work on a spoiler. But what I can do is go ba blam and ba blam. Uh, hopefully, this will work. Okay, hopefully that's. I'll, I'll I'll work on a spoiler. I'll have to find this later. Uh, find the files later. It's just really annoying because I swear I have a folder that I found the other day, and I was like, oh, I found all my old uh, Dino Defenders stuff that I thought I'd lost, but now I've like sort of lost that file, that folder again. Um. So, I don't know. May maybe I'll get back to it one day. Anywho. Let's, uh, let's get cracking. 
with the Nekin. It's been good, not, nice to see like a lot of new faces to the stream today, I'll say that. I'll say that with confidence. <laughs> Which makes no sense. Um, but yeah, no, it is nice just to see uh, new faces. And by faces I mean usernames on here. Always nice. Today is a fun stream, says Jurassic World New Air. <laughs> Lance Moore says you should hear Jack's butchering of Hispanic names on his commentaries. It's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I'm terrible. Terrible. Crass says that Michael Crichton interview was interesting. Got any more? Uh, I do have some more, yeah. It's just whether or not I can, uh, I'm can. i allowed to play them on stream. I believe the C-SPAN one, I'm a, I was allowed to, I'm allowed to uh, stream it because uh, because I bought a copy of it and I believe I read their, their copyright uh, uh, rules for C-SPAN and I believe as long as it's like done in fair use, so me talking over it and stuff like that is is helps. But I'll have to see. I've got loads of different stuff, like loads of really obscure stuff I don't know many people know about. It's ones of him in the American Supreme Court talking about uh, certain things. change this music but yeah um, sounds interesting Jack well if uh, those can ever be shared in the future whether on stream or on discord chat that would be cool yeah um, I don't know if some of them have lasted because I ripped them from YouTube uh, ages ago because I have this folder of like 
Crichton interviews about global warming and stuff that I've collected over the years. Um, but I'll, I'll see about archiving them somewhere. Yeah, I just figured, like, because with um, the whole recent... Uh, I say recent news, but it's actually events. Recent events of, like, Twitter banning Trump and then, uh, like, in, in all of Silicon Valley going after Trump, essentially. And, and I'm, not, I'm not an advocate for Trump, per se. I'm not saying I like or dislike the guy. I'm, I'm trying to just be neutral here. But watching the... Uh, the social media companies ban the guy and then you know they all work together to ban the competition for his supporters so they don't even have like a social media platform to go to which was parlor and then seeing what the american news was saying about all these pe- all these people and have been saying about people who support uh trump and all this sort of stuff um and even over in my, in my country with the whole brexit issue like just seeing what people say about other people was just kept reminding me of this video by Crichton and it's like my channel isn't a political one and you know that's the that's the danger of of political discourse online is everything becomes political so I'm I'm kind of trying not to shoot myself in the foot here with this <laughs> subject but I figured that it was more important to to show uh, or at least play Crichton's video about the American mass media and the way they frame stuff um, because I think it's important that, uh, to to sort of like sorry I'm just concentrating on this line to show that this isn't a new thing because it can it, a lot of people out there can get really emotional about it all and uh, and get really kind of insane over it all and to show that it's nothing new, it's still a problem. Um, but the I like I don't know because the idea of like the the social media companies and the and the big tech giants getting together to like completely de-platform other other platforms. It's kind of I don't know. It seems kind of strange to me and kind of dangerous. It, it doesn't seem like it's going to help the problem. It seems like it's just going to exacerbate it further. But that was that was the uh, initial thing that got me thinking. Hey, I want to actually stream one of these Crichton things. So, never not so clever at this. Is the best thing Silicon Valley do is overplay their hand. Mm, yeah, yeah. They don't. They never never think it's going to s- snap back and get them some in some way. But it will. It's like um, country, some countries have been talking about the idea of um, banning Twitter and Facebook because the pol- the politicians there have suddenly realised they're like, well, hang on, if if Twitter and Facebook and and all the and these banks and all that sort of stuff and airlines can start banning a politician for something that you know they don't like then my head's on the chopping block so who's to say they won't do it to me so then they're like well then maybe this platform shouldn't be in our country and then now twitter's like no don't ban us in countries and it's just like it's stupid this is all one of the one of like the reasons i got off twitter so long ago was like i i not not that i saw this coming but the the bloody polarization of everything was just it was just just so boring and it wasn't fun so that's why the only social media I have now is YouTube if you could call it social media even though it's like video I guess it is social media because we're talking aren't we um, is YouTube which is no pretty picnic let's just say that um you have to it's like eggshells you have to walk on eggshells everywhere on YouTube um, 
Discord, if you want to class that as social media, and Instagram. And Instagram is obviously owned by Facebook. And the only reason I have Instagram is because it's like, I don't know, it doesn't seem, it probably is if you search for it, but my Instagram feed isn't very political. So it's like, I'm, it's nice to have a, a place where I can just share my artwork and not have to worry about uh, someone screaming about Trump or Biden or whoever it is. Uh. <laughs> like if I if I want to if 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 I want politics in my life, I'll I'll seek it out myself because I am fascinated with it. It's just not on my social media because it just it just devolves into ad hominems and and insult throwing. Never ask clever. This is Instagram is the least humanizing. A face goes a long way to help people treat each other better. Well, yeah, I'm not saying um, Instagram is is good necessarily. It's uh, I'm talking about like me personally. It, it, it's one I just dump my artwork on and I don't think about it too much. But there's a lot of crap on Instagram. A lot of uh, I don't know. There's some. There's probably something psychological to the fact that people just take pictures of their faces over and over again, like staring into the mirror. If you stare long enough into the abyss, the abyss stares back. Uh, Crass says, I can't stand to open Twitter much anymore. It's all radical lefties and radical righties, and it's so effing annoying, says Crask. Yeah, just delete the app. Just get rid of it. You don't need it. You're talking about the, uh, the whole Spinosaurus juvenile thing again. I had to actually message the guy who keeps messaging about that, telling me, telling him to, or asking him kindly to stop tagging me in posts, because <laughs> he's like, he's constantly messaging, asking me to get the message to Trevoro, or for me to write it into canon that the Spinosaurus was a juvenile at Jurassic Park Three, and he like keeps saying, oh, the overwhelming amount of fans agree with me and all this sort of stuff, and it's like. Okay, I've got the I've got the message. I'm not I'm not promising I'm going to do anything with it though. But please stop tagging me in posts. That's basically what I said. <laughs> Harrison, there's that theory that the T-Rex in Jurassic Park Three is the infant from the Lost World, which I don't like. 
Well, have you heard my theory? <laughs> you might hate my theory even more. My theory, Harrison, you're finding the problem of the... Uh, it's the video called The Problem with the Jurassic Park 3 T-Rex or something like that. Like, it's, it's that video. Lance says, has anyone played the Lego Jurassic Park game? I remember getting the early in the morning and sat there and playing it for the rest of the day. Yeah, I played it. I mean, it's for kids, so it's like really easy. But like, I played it and uh, yeah, it was fun. It was fun for what it was. Crass says, if the Spinos are juvenile, then I'm Claire Deering. The thing is, like, when I was asked about that, like, my thoughts on the Spinosaurus being a juvenile, and I said, it's... The Spinosaurus in Jurassic Park 3 was fully grown... Because that's what the filmmakers intended, but it is young, like it's um, because it, with what we wrote on the DPG website, for the viral marketing, like it's it's, only a couple of years old, or just over a couple of years old, we really two and a half years old or whatever. But obviously in Jurassic they have growth accelerators and all that sort of stuff, so like it's it's reached its full, full size as far as I'm concerned. Unless they do change it later on down the line, but as far as I know, it's that's not it's not going to happen. So it's quite confusing because you're just like, yes, it is young, but it's not, but it is fully grown.
<laughs> Never not so clever this is. It wasn't a Spino, it was a hybrid Baryonyx. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that old fan theory. It's like, okay, okay. The fact that Grant calls it a Spinosaurus and the fact that everything in Jurassic Park 3 calls it a Spinosaurus makes means nothing. <laughs> Do you like that the content from the websites is going into the movies and series, says Loon? Yes, yes I do. Why wouldn't I like that? Kind of wish people would come up with cooler things to speculate on rather than just saying Spino is a juvenile, but oh well, not trying to ruin their fun. I just find it boring, says Krask. Well, that's the thing, like, I don't want to say, like, it's it's not boring for them, but I'm I'm with you on, like, there's, there's other things that are more interesting to me about the franchise that I hear fans not talking about. Well, I don't hear fans talking about. God, my English today, what's wrong with me? Um... My only language is failing me. It's because I didn't get much sleep last night because of the baby. That's going to be my excuse. Even though it's true. I think I'm riding on like four hours sleep. Um. It's like what I was saying with like the whole Hammond. In my video, Hammond was not good or whatever. Like I talk about, like Hammond's motives and all that sort of stuff. Like I don't hear fans talking about that as much as they. Uh... Not that they should be, but like there's certain theories and stuff about Hammond that I think is wrong but that, that's like not to get too sidetracked my point is like that was like a subject I'm always trying to find a subject that I don't hear many people talking about is my point Crass says, any chance of a wee small Jurassic misconception today? Um, well, I've only got like five minutes before I have to go. <laughs> so, probably not. Uh, I can quickly, let's just have a quick look at my list. Let's have a look. And what we got? No, I've kind of covered most of the ones I want to cover for the time being, but I will I will get get ideas for ones in the future. I haven't watched the Jurassic movie in a while, so I do need to get back to watching something cuz that's where I usually get a lot of my ideas is I'll watch the movies and then I'm like think about something and I'm like, "Oh yeah, I haven't really thought about that in that way before." So
Hello, Titan of Serpents. You turned up in the last five minutes. Lance Moore says, wrong colour. Spoiler! <laughs> What's with the early stream today? Got stuff to do, says Titan of Serpents. Yeah, so... Um, on December 31st, in the UK, the government said that you're allowed to change your bubble. Now, if you don't know what a bubble is, it's basically... If you've got a child under one, you can merge your household with another. Uh, so you basically create a support bubble. And my ours was originally with my mum, um, but when it reached December 31st, we decided we were going to change to my sister because she's got two kids, including my nephew who loves Jurassic Park and stuff. Um, and we figured we'd change to them so we could, uh, you know, keep the kids entertained and stuff because they're struggling a little bit with like sort of what's going on. You know, they're getting very bored because they're locked in their houses and all this sort of stuff. Um, so we bubbled up with them and so we're going to head to theirs today um, and we're leaving soon and my wife was saying that the baby is uh, will need to nap in the car so to time uh, to do the timing of the naps uh, I'm streaming earlier so we can leave at a certain time um, and then get to my sisters and have fun I'm really excited actually because we're gonna on the day Camp Cretaceous season two comes out. Um, even though, as I said personally, I'm I'm not like overtly amazed by overly amazed by um, Camp Cretaceous. Uh, my nephew loves it, so I am excited to spend the day with him. He's gonna come over, and we're gonna watch it together for the first time. Uh, hopefully, that'll all work out, and we can do that. Yeah, it's sort of family stuff today. But next week it should be back to uh, 12 till 3. Never not so clever this is, that's the most wholesome thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. It's nice to spend time with the family. Like, I just introduced uh, little Charlie um, to the Super Nintendo Jurassic Park games, like the Chaos Continues and stuff, and he loves them. So I'm taking that to his today. Uh, and we're going to be... He, he desperately wants to get to the T-Rex chasing the guys on the Jeeps, but he... He absolutely loves those old 2D platformers, so I'm going to take my Raspberry Pi, which has all those on, 
today and uh, and play those at his house. So, okay, I'm just going to finish the green here and then I'll be done. And then I'm going to end the stream a little bit early. So, bear with me, everyone. Yeah, I miss my a lot of my family lance. It sucks. It sucks big time. It's such a strange s series of events, and you're going on for a year now. Well, I mean, the coronavirus has been going on over a year, but like, um, just just the reaction to it and the way we have to do like life has just been upended. It's just so surreal. And then on top of that, have a have your first baby. That's the boat I'm in. <laughs> right, just one last little bit and then I'm going to go. I should be going now, but I'm going to... Just do this last bit. See, what I've been working on here, which I'm not going to say what it is exactly. Some of you might be able to guess from the blurred image, but I'm just going to sort of leave it in the air um, like this is an animation frame and it's like this is how long it takes to do one animation cell when it's this detailed and there's like dozens for this frame although I've only got like maybe one or two more to do well two more two more to do and then this this frames finished it's taken me over a month to do this frame <laughs> but just because balancing life balancing home life and working on Clayton's videos and my actual job or one of my jobs it's like balancing a lot never a dull day in the Ewan's household but yeah just to summarize just before I finish um, I just want to say like those of you who've been uh, oh Big Shark has returned <laughs> hello there um, yeah, just to summarise that Crichton video we watched, like, the reason I, I wanted to play that because it is just, I do worry about a lot of people falling into partisan politics, and I've spoken to some personal friends of mine, and it's, it's almost like you can't have a full conversation, and I say that with the understanding that, like, you know, jokes are made between friends and stuff, so it's... It's very hard to have the serious conversation, but I've noticed even online there's like this people get like a reputation around them, which might not even be true. But the the idea is is like I worry about everyone falling down uh, too many pitfalls of like that sort of stuff online. And I just wanted to make this video or have this stream today as a way for you guys to at least know that Terradome 3000 is at least a place where you can come and let your hair down. We had to address uh, address the the annoying situation with online discourse when it comes to like politics and stuff. But Terradome 3000 is going to be a channel where you can come and, you know, just relax, enjoy some painting, talk about dinosaurs, talk about Camp Cretaceous, ask me what my favourite dinosaur is for the one millionth time. <laughs> and don't worry about all that BS, but I just wanted to make sure you guys knew that myself and Crichton... Uh, are on the same page about all that sort of stuff so anyway that's it, I think I'm going to be done for today uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed today's stream I will see you next Sunday uh, 12 o'clock it should be but um, if it changes I'll let you know in my uh, uh, YouTube uh, channel posts I think that's what they call them but yeah, so yeah, anyway, thank you guys. Thank you, Big Shark and Never Not So Clever, this for the tips. Much appreciated, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye bye.